All right, saludos everyone. Thank you for joining me and Jen on this very last day of long EPSICON. Um, so Vincent gave you an introduction into kind of a global view of the potential of forming brines through deliquescence on Mars. I'm not going to consider the local view, um, specifically with implications for Jezero Crater since we're sending a robot there and I would like to get all this data. So, um, just a quick review. Germana has already talked about this, but thus far there's only really two missions that have been able to give us meteorological data and tell us then the potential stability of brines at these uh, areas, and that is the Curiosity rover, which is equatorial, basically it's about minus four, um, and the Phoenix uh, lander. Ooh, that's the other one. I was, knew I was going to do that. Um, and the Phoenix one, which is up here, uh, about 68 degrees north, so that is uh, polar. These are the two that has given us uh, meteorological data. These are the only two that we can then use the T and the relative humidity in order to figure something out about the local scale uh, environment and if brines are stable there. And then just so you can see, Mars 2020 will be going around here and ExoMars on this side. So we're, we're getting somewhere in between Curiosity and Phoenix. And I'm going to get into why that tweener zone is important. Um, but just as a quick introduction to the phase diagram, um, since I will be showing this a lot. So when we're looking at calcium perchlorate, uh, Here's the, its phase diagram at a eutectic temperature of 198 Kelvin and an activity of 0.53. I keep doing that. Um, that. That eutect is right here. The black line you see here, that is the ice line. So something important to note um, is that Mars rovers give you relative humidity, but with respect to ice. Okay. The activity of a brine can be related to the relative humidity, but only with respect to liquid. All right, so you're dividing something by a PSAT of ice versus a PSAT of liquid. So when you're talking about the ice line, you're talking about relative, this line is relative humidity with respect to ice equals 100% on an RH of liquid diagram. Okay, keep that in mind. This blue line, that's the deliquescence relative humidity. If we cross that line, that's when we would be able to have a liquid. Now, as Vincent mentioned, uh, you do end up having metastable solutions and hysteresis effects. So if I'm trucking along here, I'm a T and an RH, and I suddenly cross here, yay, I'm a liquid. Um, many experiments uh, from Katie Prim, Reina Goff, Daniel Nutting, uh, even from the group German, has shown if you cross this line, you don't immediately become ice. You kind of have, like, I imagine it as a slushy. I haven't seen pictures from these experiments, but I think slushies. <laughs> so around here, you have a little slushy. And then the temperatures and RH start swinging back. And you should, theoretically, right around here, give up your water. But you don't. You have to wait until you hit the ERH, the efflorescence relative humidity. So that's a hysteresis effect. So you have liquid, and then you continue having liquid until you pass this line on this side. So the liquid stability area is expanded because of this metastability. Sir, what's the ERH? Efflorescence relative humidity. So that's where you lose the, uh, the liquid. And it goes back, so the salt will transition from the aqueous solution back into the solid crystalline site. All right, so now that we got that introduction into the phase diagram, we're going to start putting pretty dots on it. So this is the Phoenix data. Herman has shown this to you. Um, this was the newly recalibrated data. Thank you, Herman, for doing that, because the Phoenix data made no sense to me when we saw it. Um, but as you can see here, if you put the raw data and then, uh, so that's what you're seeing in the dark purple. Um, and then I took the hourly averages and that is in the pretty magenta. And you can see that at Phoenix, we, we have several points that nicely cross into that liquid state. And so it, this wouldn't mean that you would just have a liquid there. It means you now, again, like I mentioned, have to wait until you hit back into the ERH. So at Phoenix, things are a little bit easy. Let's compare this to uh, MSL. Oof, MSL's tough, all right? Uh, so here, and here's the other reason why MSL is tough, error bars, whoa, that's a thing. So MSL actually, uh, within error, a relative humidity measurement somewhere down here could be negative. 
And so when that happens, I say, you are unreal. The instrument probably is a little shaky, so I throw that data out. That's why you're not seeing things going this way, because with an error, that data point makes no sense. Also, side note, with an error, you could have relative humidity with respect to liquid of about 1,000%, and I thought that was weird. Um, so engineers, please make better instruments. Thank you. Um, so, But if you account for the error bars uh, for these points, uh, I have drawn boxes around two points that within error, you would actually be in the liquid state. Um, those will happen in Sol 1232 and Sol 1311, um, specifically during the morning and late evening. Um, I then have a fully coupled heat and mass transfer model, and so I decided to look at pairs of albedo and thermal inertia um, that were at least kind of seen by MSL just to see and be able to predict for MSL where it could potentially be, uh, see liquid formation. And this is, so unlike for Vince's plot where he showed percent of year that was at the surface, my percent of year is summed over the subsurface up to the surface. So I'm summing up all of the potential hours that could have happened there. In the, uh, so that's what you're seeing here in color, the percent of the year. So up here, apparently, it's happy-go-lucky. So if you were high albedo, really low thermal inertia, that would be great. However, I looked at a map of Mars and I did not see that combination, so forget about that. In the white dots, you see the combinations of thermal inertia and albedo that MSL actually saw. So most of the time it's in this black zone, so that means nope nopes. Um, but over here, um, thermal inertia of 180, albedo of 0.11, Sol 1232 it turns out, you do have liquids. And remember, that's also the data point in the previous plot that I said with an error, it would be in the liquid. So the model says, yay. Um, and then Vincent had told you that uh, when you're considering diffusion into the regolith, um, the reason it's kind of easy on Mars is because things look like a beach. I'm from Puerto Rico, so I'm used to seeing these kind of things, except I demand the actual ocean there and a the piña colada. And apparently that's not a thing today. Um, but this would be Sol 1232, where potentially MSL had trucked over uh, for forming liquids there. Okay, introduction into those two. Those are the extremes, right? Something equatorial and something polar. And now we're gonna go over to March 2020, which will be somewhere in between-ish. I think it was like 20 degrees north latitude. And what I want to look at is apply these same techniques, um, except in this case, uh, also use a GCM to be able to predict what the surface condition would be at Jezero Crater. See, do we ever cross that DRH line? And then once we do, how long do you have a liquid until you go back to that ERH line, um, and are these liquids habitable to life as we know it? And I think Vince already gave the punchline away, which is nope nopes again. All right, so I have, this, this is my part down here. This, and by the way, I am no James Tuttle Keen. I am not an artist. This is my ability to be an artist, a box with a pretty cloud on top. Um, and that cloud was made by PowerPoint, thank you. Uh, so Alejandro Soto uh, has ran the Mars Wharf model for us. Um, here you have, so it's a resolution of five by five, 52 vertical levels. I then take the lower values for T and pH2O. Um, I allow that to diffuse through a regolith column. I go several times the annual skin depth, that way I can actually see the full diffusion. And it's not only in heat, but it's also in mass. And then uh, my vertical resolution, there's one centimeters, and it's very tiny uh, time steps, but I save the conditions hourly. Um, and then within every element, I check if the T and RH combination actually allows for deliquescence. So um, here is the quick glimpse of these results. Uh, in the gray scaling, you're seeing from one centimeter all the way over to 10 centimeters. Um, and as you can see, we get really close, so close. Um, but not quite there yet. Now, as we all know, though, GCMs have knobs on them, and then you can just go and go tweak, tweak, tweak to the rhythm of the beat, hey, hey, and then things work. So, because what if something random happens at the near surface? What if there was a dust storm? What if uh, the thermal inertia and albedo locally is a little bit different than what's considered a GCM? Um, but just to show you that within a tolerance level of a Kelvin and a 1% uh, in RH, we do actually enter the liquid zone here. And really, within numerical error, going plus or minus one Kelvin, going plus or minus RH 1%, that's, that's within error, so that's fine. So within error and within knob twisting, 
we would be able to form liquids at Jezero Crater. Um, these type of liquids would be there between LS160 and 190, forming in the late evening and shortly after midnight, and only for about 0.6% of the year. So not uh, a whole lot, but something. Now, going back to that special region, because I said, are these liquids habitable? So just remember, we were really close here, and I want to come up here. So yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, but here's another way of looking at it. If you have a liquid on Mars, and it's stable against boiling and evaporation, that means it has to be in equilibrium with the near surface atmosphere. So then, if I am at this box, at the edge of this box right there, where T is 255 Kelvin, the activity of that solution is 0.6, for, the acti for an, uh, solution at an activity of 0.6 to be stable against the atmosphere, the relative humidity of the atmosphere must then be 60% with respect to liquid. So at that temperature, the pH2O you need to do that is 90 pascals. Um, if you find somewhere on Mars where that happens, please let me know. Because, yeah, that's not going to happen. This is Puerto Rico. <laughs> PR is habitable, I agree. You should all go there. So, um, but I'm a very quantitative person, so I wanted to at least be able to compare MSL, Jezero, and Phoenix. So I'm going to suggest, and I'm very open to suggestions from you two, is a metric based on the special region, quote unquote, that NASA is using to define whether uh, an area should be protected or not. And so this is a very basic metric where we're looking at the distance away from that special region. Um, and I normalized it such that at the furthest point here, zero relative humidity and really cold, 150 Kelvin, I define that to be equal one. And once you do that, then you can scale everything else, have the distances away. And then I was told that people, when they consider zero, which in my model would be zero distance would be there, when people say zero, that means bad. So I said, fine, say one minus distance, and now one equals good and zero equals bad, great. So that's what I did here. So that's why the colors aren't following the quote unquote distance. So then if we apply this metric to Jezero, Gale Crater, and Phoenix Landing Site, I find the mode um, from this metric. And you can see that Phoenix is happy-go-lucky up about 0.6. Gale Crater is, you know, as expected, 0.25, very low. And Jezero is not quite in between, but it is much better than Gale. So if I were March 2020 and I'd be uh, roving around, I'd think that there might be the potential to form liquids, but those liquids are not habitable to life as we know it, but maybe we don't know life quite well yet. So brines may form at Jezero Crater during that period. Uh, the brines that are produced are not special at all. Um, and I am suggesting that maybe in order to quantify the distribution of habitable quote unquote environments on Mars, if we are actually keen in using this special regions definition, that maybe we can use this new metric to actually do that. And before I let you all go, I am the lead convener for this conference down here, First Billion Years Habitability, it's happening in Big Sky, Montana. We're going to go into Yellowstone National Park. We're going to have fun. And then we're going to talk about how life could have originated on Earth, on other planets, and even with extensions to exoplanets. Abstract deadline is July 3rd. So please submit. Thank you very much.